All right, hey, how are we doing out there, guys? So welcome back to another episode of the Bastion Black Performance Podcast. So kind of picking up where I left off um, the other day. So the other day, um, I kind of stopped with the end of November 14th. And um, so you can remember we got in that, uh, we got in that big scrape in that house um, in the, uh, like, way south, uh, like over in this section. Um about as far as I can go on the map, and uh, and then we we hold up for the night um, after it. So you know, leading into November the fifteenth. Like I said, I don't honestly remember where we stayed that night. So now, the next few days of uh, Operation Phantom Fury of the Battle of Fallujah uh, are all a complete blur to me as far as what day was what. And so, like I said, you know, as cryptic or whatever as you want to call it, is aside from the very first day of the. Uh, of the Battle of Fallujah, the only way that I remember specific days are based on, um, you know, who got killed on a particular day. And it's because, and it doesn't take a, you know, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out. It's like, you look at, like, look at these streets and houses. And if you spend all day, like, on the streets and in the houses and clearing that, you know, from a ground eye, you know, from basically like a, you know, like a worm's view, a slug's view, you have no idea where you're at in the city, what's what. Or anything, so you know, I apologize, but I don't really apologize because that's just <laughs> that's just the nature of it. Um, so what I'll kind of do for the next few days, so it would be the fifteenth, the sixteenth, the seventeenth, and the eighteenth, is I'll kind of tell some stories uh, that are kind of some of them are comical, some of them are less comical from those days. But like I said, we didn't take any KIA in those days. Um, we did still take some wounded and things like that, and so. Um, you know, kind of trying to work my way around to uh, the 19th, which was a very busy day for us. So again, I don't know what days we were in what specific parts of, uh, you know, of the town and uh, and things like that. So I know that we had scraped through and we're a little bit further out west. So I think that we actually, I think that we got ourselves, you know, kind of up and out over here um, and possibly, you know, kind of up and out over here. Because there was a day where we were on a road that was kind of skirting um, the reeds. So it might've been this part down here, or it might've been more like this section out here. And so we kind of skirted around the reeds and then we ended up out kind of in a house that was not by itself, but was a little bit by itself. And there's a couple of reasons I remember that day standing out, not exactly what day it was, but so one, as we were riding along, um, let's just imagine it was this road right here. I don't know that it was, it, it's very possible that it was, but as we were kind of riding along with the Humvee, my platoon sergeant, uh, you know, kind of stopped and he said, you know, he, he looked down at the reeds, he goes, Grease, I want you to, you know, fire an entire can into, uh, into the, uh, into the reeds, into the bushes out there. So can is 48 rounds. Um, so I fire an entire can out there as we kind of like, you know, pull around. And then, so we were going to kind of hold up and take like a little bit of a, a little bit of a break, like during the middle of the day. So like I said, the thing about urban combat is that it's really like ebb and flow. Like when you're busy, or when you're like in danger, you're in like the most danger that is humanly possible. And when you're not, like you're not like at all. So we kind of pulled up in a place, I think to kind of hole up for like an hour or two, you know, because again, so we got, you know, so my company is just one company of the battalion's three companies, um, you know, and, and so this is Route Henry that runs south, north to south, all along here. So my battalion was responsible for everything south of Fran and then west of of uh, Henry here. So obviously we have three companies um, spread out in there. So there's a lot of like mixing, moving units here. Hey, this unit's kind of busy with this or, uh, you know, things are going on. Like for example, November 13th was the day, uh, it was the day that my company lost uh, Lance Corporal McLeese, KIA. But that was the day when Kilo Company had their kind of famous, what they call the Hell House. Um, you know, is the, you know, the kind of the famous picture of like First Sergeant Castle coming out of there after being shot and still having his pistol. And there was a guy by the name of Alex Nickel who got all shot up. They, uh, like Byron Norwood got killed in there. A whole bunch of people got shot. You know, it was a big, big mess. So that was the 13th. So there's always things going on. So we, so we, he has me shoot this whole can out in the reeds, wherever we were. I want to say we're probably somewhere down around in this area over here. But then we kind of pulled into this house. And I remember a couple specific things. So one, uh, we had the, like the big bulldozers with us, the D9s. We also had a D7, which is, similar it's just smaller and um and uh so one of the d9s gets stuck in the mud out there because there were like some buildings that were kind of close so because we we're going to hole up here for a little bit they wanted to destroy the building so for some reason they're going to send the bulldozer over there and it got stuck 
So one, so we just blew the top off one of the buildings with a small rocket. I remember because Staff Sergeant Navarro fired it and it hit the, it wasn't a very big like part of the building. And when it hit it, it was like, it was like a cartoon, like how much it just blew things apart. And then I shot like an entire can of Mark 19 out into it and, and like basically broke up the rest of the building that was out there. But uh, so this D9 bulldozer that gets stuck. And again, those things weigh like 80 tons, which is 20 tons more than like an M1 Abrams uh, weighs. They're humongous. So it gets stuck. So they bring over this D7 and they hook up some chains and, and cables or, what, or some cables up to it. And they try to back it up a little bit and get it to pull that one out. And so that thing, <laughs> that thing gets stuck trying to pull that out as well. So then they end up bringing over the tank wrecker. So the tank wrecker is basically, so it's like an M1, like it's a tank chassis, but then it basically has a huge winch on it. And it is exactly what it thinks it is. It's a recovery vehicle for um, the tanks. Because obviously tanks tend to have a lot of mechanical problems, just as a general statement, you know, like, like all other vehicles do. But obviously you need special equipment to be able to tow a tank or to pull it out of a mess and things like that. So they pull this thing over. And I remember it was kind of interesting because I'd never seen a vehicle like this before. And, uh, you know, it actually, so it has a blade on the front of it that it actually drops that kind of comes into the ground because when it starts winching, so I mean, this thing is winching a D7, which probably weighs, I don't know, 50 tons, 40, 50 tons, that is hooked up to a D9 that weighs 80 tons. And so like, obviously, so it starts winching and then those things all start trying to pull each other. And so they managed to eventually get each other out of the, out of the mud there. And I remember another thing happening that day because we had all started to acquire like weapons that we picked up off of dead dudes. And, um, and we all kind of liked AKs. And, and a lot of this, I've talked to similarly about this in other videos of mine, which is the, the M855. So the green tip, 62 grain steel core, uh, 556 had a really poor reputation for its terminal performance. Now, a fair amount of that could be attributed to just poor shot placement. And like I said, I think a lot of it is also comes down to they spend so much time in boot camp and what in infantry school and stuff like teaching you like all this one shot, one kill BS. And it basically makes you think that like all you have to do is put one of these rounds into somebody and because it tumbles, it's so unstable that it just, you know, it's like, I remember they used specifically when I was in infantry school on alpha range, which is like the field fire range that you do kind of at the very end of your field um, sort of uh, phase. They're like, oh, you know, you're liable to hit a guy in the foot, but it doesn't come out until it gets out of his shoulder. Just dumb shit like that. But anyway, so it makes you think that like, hey, as long as I hit this guy, this round is going to do a lot of damage and put him down. And that's just one, that's just unrealistic. That's just not really what happens uh, an awful lot of times. Um, but, uh, you know, so there was, you know, and then it's also like, let's say you shoot a guy in like at point blank range inside of a house, you shoot him in the chest and he collapses within 10 seconds. Is that an instant incapacitation? Well, no. Is it a very quick incapacitation? I would say probably, but like 10 seconds in a firefight in a house is an eternity. So a lot of it is, it's both the, the actual performance of the round, it's the incorrect perception of what should happen and all those things. So a fair amount of our, of our dudes would kind of carry AKs occasionally and, and maybe uh, they wouldn't really use them like seriously, but they might get in a house and, you know, well, and also because AKs have, you know, full auto um, you know, capability. So, you know, sometimes they'd get in a house and they just like, they just use it. They just, they just reach it in windows and like spray it around and stuff like that. And, um, so we kind of all had AKs myself included. And so I remember cause the house that we were going to go like kind of set in to sort of take this break in the middle of the day. Uh, I remember, you know, people are going in the house and they're like, Hey, get in there, clean your weapons. And we had this one idiot from weapons platoon and he goes in there and starts cleaning his AK instead of his M16. As soon as they saw that they come out, they're like, all right, Anyone who's got, you know, AKs, like, can't use them anymore, toss them in the back of one of the Humvees, whatever, and, you know, kind of basically got everybody in trouble because he was a moron. Um, and so we were there for a while. So at some point, my platoon sergeant and one of the other platoon sergeants kind of went to go wander around the reeds. And I see them, they're, like, right out in front of me. They're not very far away. And so somehow my platoon sergeant, had, like, he had acquired a Benelli shotgun at this point. And I see him, like, start blasting, uh, like, into the reeds. And they're, I don't know, what, are they, 50 yards away. They're not really far away. And I'm kind of watching, I'm like, what are they doing? Because I can't see anything. And he kind of comes back and I was like, what are you doing? He's, he's like, he's like, oh, there was like X amount of dudes like kind of sitting in the bush. And so me and Staff Sergeant, I can't remember who he's out there with, Staff Sergeant Mortimer or somebody like that. Uh, you know, we whacked him. And I was like, oh, nice. And he goes, well, and there was, I don't know what was going on, but there was like another dude in the reeds, like right over beside him, who was just like covered in shrapnel wounds. And, uh, and uh, you know, so so I shot him. And so so I, I killed that guy. And I was like, I was like, he was covered in shrapnel wounds. And he's like, yeah, I don't know where it came from. I was like, you do know I just shot 48 grenades over there, right? And he's like, yeah, no, I shot him. 
And I was like, okay. <laughs> but in my head, I was like, okay, so there was clearly a dude in the bushes he told me to shoot at. And I, you know, whacked that guy with the Mark 19. And then he tried to take credit for it, which is, uh, it is the most, aside from drinking, it is the most prevalent pastime of Marines, which is trying to uh, steal credit for uh, shooting enemies. But, um, so that was one particular day. There was another day, um, there was another day where we got into like a house that we stayed at at night. And then we stayed there an entire day. Um, so we stayed there the entire next day. And I don't know where we were at. I want to say we were a little bit further back up north. Because up here somewhere, I don't know if I'll be able to find it. There's a flower factory. Um, and I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's over here. Or maybe this is the flower factory. I, I can't remember. Because um, it wasn't in my company's sector. It ended up being one of the other company's sectors. But... I can remember there's a flower factory because we were staying there for a day. They were like, Hey, we want you guys, uh, you know, we need to punch out a patrol and clear the buildings that are directly adjacent to our building. Cause we don't, we don't want someone who's like, you know, in the building, like next door, like being able to pop off, you know, RPG rounds or something at us. So, um, so I go to patrol around, uh, you know, with the squad of dudes and, uh, I just remember looking at the flower factory, which was a long ways away. I want to say it was like 600 yards away. And there was clearly a dude on top of it. And, uh, and I was carrying a 240. And um, so I had a, a guy by the name of Park Hill who was being my uh, my gun team leader and my, you know, kind of my ammo man. So I set this up on top of like a like a car that was kind of blown up in the road there or whatever. And I'm adjusting my my rear aperture sight for that. And then um, and I remember telling him, I was like, hey, I want to shoot at that. Like, do we have anybody in the flower factory? And he's like, hang on. So we kind of start checking. And so then it comes back on the radio that like whatever one of our units and by our, I don't necessarily mean my battalion. I, I, I think it might've been, I think we might have snipers or something over there. They had taken one of those green Ivan targets that you guys would be associated with in the military, you know, like the big cardboard silhouettes that are green. And they had put it up on the roof just as a joke. <laughs> and the flower factories, I don't know, it's like five or six stories tall. Like it's a big building, but I could see that thing clear as day. So I was about ready to start shooting at it. And they're like, no, 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 it's, you know, they put up a target up there as a joke. I'm like, oh, good joke, guys. But, <laughs> but uh, so we're we're kind of patrolling around the outside of um, outside of this house, and uh, I had kind of a in the interest of full disclosure uh, because you have funny happenings in the uh, in combat zones. I had uh, an immediate onset of uh, needing to use the restroom, uh, the kind of immediate onset where. You don't actually make the designated time standards. And so as we're getting close to this building, I was like, you know, and at this point, like we're kind of all starting to get sick and stuff, you know, because like Fallujah, like one, we're not eating well. And there's like so many dead bodies and dead animals and, you know, and stuff like that all around. And we're not sleeping very much. So you get really susceptible to, uh, you know, like different kinds of sickness, which is just, that's common military operations, you know, or like you hear about this a lot of people like who are in like labor camps and stuff like that. You know, I don't, I'm not comparing what we, what we experienced to that, but you know, as you start to get broken down from both activity, lack of food, lack of sleep, all that kind of stuff, it becomes susceptible, uh, susceptible. So anyways, so I go to rush in this house and I didn't quite meet the time standards. So I was like, okay, so I kind of, I found this flower pot. And, um, so I, I, I pull my trousers down to, uh, to handle my business there. And I set the machine gun down in front of me. And as soon as I get my trousers down and sit on this flower pot, I was sitting like right under this tree and all of a sudden he like snap, snap, crack, 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 snap, snap, snap. Like, and branches of this tree start falling off. And the wall is like an eight foot wall. So I'm not like in any danger of getting shot like right now. But I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Because as soon as that happened, you know, I start hearing like, hey, where's that machine gun? Hey, where's that machine gun? And I'm like, ah, machine gun's busy for a second. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I don't, I don't know who ended up shooting at us and, and what, because like it died down and, um, you know, and again, and our job, like on that particular patrol was like, we did not want to get sucked way out away from the, the, the house or the, the little compound, you know, the building where my company was. We were just trying to make sure that the buildings directly um, adjacent to us were not filled with, uh, with dudes. So now what ended up being kind of a, it's a little bit gross, admittedly, but what was kind of a sort of a funny thing is so at the time I was still wearing my Under Armour compression shorts that I had on when I got wounded on November 9th. And, um, uh, because I, cause when I got evac I hadn't had a time to, you know, I was sitting, it was the only pair of underwear I had. And then when I got back, like we weren't like allowed to take our boots off or, or anything like at night, it, it was like, Hey, like, you know, you could, you could pull out like a poncho liner or something to sit there, but it's like, you're basically like ready to go at all times. So I'd had a chance to change my underwear. 
And, um, and so that, that pair of underwear had holes all over it. So like I said, when I got hit, I had like two holes in my butt, two holes in like my groin, two holes in my right calf, or one hole in my right calf, like a couple holes in my left calf. And then I got stuff in the wrist, but my Under Armour compression shorts, um, must've had like dozens of holes and like bits of metal. So like, like the kinds of shards of metal that come off, like when you're grinding things or welding, like that kind of stuff. Um, those shorts were full of it. So in my head, I was kind of like, Hey, you know, I could take this underwear home and then like wash it. And this is kind of like a funny, like ugly trophy, you know, cause there's just like, cause of all those holes in there, obviously I only had a couple, like a few, like actually penetrate. So it meant that like a whole bunch of stuff hit and, you know, cause the other thing about like shrapnel is what makes shrapnel cause such really terrifying wounds is that it's really irregularly shaped and, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, waffling through the air and stuff like that. But it also means that it's momentum dies out very quickly. And so what must've happened is I got hit with a bunch of stuff that was just oddly enough shaped and moving weird enough that like it hit me and like left like a bruise, like impact wise, but it didn't penetrate, um, into the skin or at least didn't penetrate enough to like uh, to get stuck in the skin there. And so that was, that was kind of funny. And, um, and I remember we got back to that house. It was, uh, it was kind of comical because, uh, we had tanks with us and like the tank dudes had a spare antenna and, um, they had a hook on it and they just used it to hold onto their canteen cups to warm their coffee up off of the, uh, off of the exhaust of the, <laughs> of the tanks. So I was like, Oh, okay guys. Uh, so that was one of those days where we just, um, we just uh, stayed put there. Um, There's another day, you know, we, we ended up, like I said, kind of like out West at some points of this. Um, and obviously we were still getting into stuff like during the day, but it just, it wasn't like the really dangerous stuff. And at some point we'd also started uh, like our campaign of burning things. And so what we kind of started to do was when we would go into houses, because we started to find, because um, at this point, if I can try to explain it, at this point, we hadn't actually been all the way to the end of the city, quote unquote. We, you know, we, but you move a lot, you know, like north, south, east, west, like you're kind of shifting around a lot. But we were still somewhat in the, like, in our, or at least in our brain, like we were still somewhat in the, like, push all the way to the, to the edge of the city, because then, you know, we'll, we know we'll have made it to like the edge of the city. Or whatever, but so obviously there's people behind us, in front of us, to the sides of us all the time. And what we started to notice was that like there would be buildings where like people would leave MREs and like other like kinds of food trash, and then you know it would get entered into later, or we'd enter into other buildings and they would find MRE trash and stuff. Basically, that these you know that the insurgents, that the uh, the foreign fighter dudes had taken that they'd found from our stuff and we're like using it to like, you know, eat and, and whatever. So we kind of got to the point where like, what we started doing in houses is like, we would pile all the stuff in like the living room or like one of the rooms and then we would light it on fire, uh, you know, basically like, um, you know, a, a denial to the enemy kind of thing. So we started implementing uh, that kind of policy as well. And, um, and so, you know, days like, again, they're kind of like dragging on. So at some point there's, um, there's another day, which was, it was an interesting day. I wish I kind of, man, I don't know. I know roughly where we were because there's kind of a, kind of an open field bias. And I want to say we might've possibly been, um, like either somewhere around like here because there's kind of an open area or maybe somewhere around there, but you know, we were moving and like clearing and things like that. Remember the tanks were kind of right in front of us. And one of the tanks hit a house that lit on fire and there was a bunch of people milling around, uh, around me. And, um, and all of a sudden this house exploded and it must have been filled from floor to ceiling with mortar rounds because it goes boom, blows up. And I can see all these mortar rounds in the air. And so I remember, you know, there's a few people milling around my Humvee and I told them, I, I was like, hey, get to cover. I can see all this stuff. And so all these mortar rounds start hitting the ground and they weren't like going off. It, it, it wasn't like this didn't end up being like, you know, the death barrage or anything like that. They're all hitting the ground, but, and they almost, it kind of sounded weird. Like almost, I remember in my head, it, like it sounded like, I don't know, like soccer balls or something hit the ground. It was like a bloop, 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 like hitting the ground. And somehow it didn't hit anybody. I don't know how they hit like all over by us. And so I remember, uh, <laughs> one of the tanks then came, uh, came like backing up out of there. And, uh, somebody said like, oh, Hey, you know, that's like their call sign was like, they had a color call sign. So there's like red platoon and blue platoon. And so I think we had blue with us at this time. And they're like, oh, you know, blue too has to go back to the train station. Cause he blew out his, uh, he blew out his, uh, 
his gun and his optics <laughs> because basically basically stuck his gun into this building you know shot it lit it on fire and then this huge secondary explosion went off and, and wrecked his optics and, and his gun or, or something to that extent and um so i thought that was kind of funny and this that particular day in that same spot i saw a really really cool engagement um and, and it was really short and so we were basically i was parked on a street um, again, I'm going to make this up because I don't remember exactly where we were. But so, uh, so imagine that, um, so imagine that I'm on like this street right here. This was like the delineation line between us and then uh, Kilo Company. So we were right here, and then the next company was directly next to us at this particular point. And so there's a house that would have been, if I was looking for it, it would have been right at my 11 o'clock that had been. Uh, it had been brought down. So like, you know, so it's kind of basically in place, but then the roof was, you know, sitting on top of the rubble on the floor. And I remember it was, it looked really cool. It was kind of like, it was, it, it almost reminded me of this one very specific, like World War II video that I had seen of some British guys in, uh, in Italy fighting. But, uh, so I see a couple kilo guys like out on the street and then, um, so all of a sudden I see green tracers whipping up over this roof, and like, you know, soo, 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 like going past. So green tracers, obviously what the enemy uses, it's Soviet standard, you know, for their weapons and ammunition. And so then, so then I see a couple of kilo company guys like run up on this roof. And again, the roof's on the ground. So they're not like super high above the ground and the roof is angled a little bit. So they're not like totally like, you know, exposing themselves over the top, but they kind of run up, you know, they each kind of chuck a grenade over the top and kind of back down, boom, boom. And then a couple green tracers go flicking by and then a couple of them like all like, you know, sort of run up over the roof and then like run down. You can like hear shooting. And so it was it was it was a really cool like I don't know like what the circumstances was exactly because obviously the, the roof blocked my view of whoever was on the other side of it. But I was like, that was kind of a, that was that looked like that looked like some shit out of like Saving Private Ryan um, or something. Where it, was all, it was almost like too like too crisp of a like of a happening to be uh, real life, you know, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But, uh, okay, so we'll kind of, uh, um, kind of, now, okay, I guess there's one more incident. This happened before or after. Man, I don't remember. Okay, anyways, so I'm going to tell, I'll tell the story now. It might have happened after the 19th. I kind of actually think that it did, but I've, now I've brought it up, so it's too late. So I had another incident where, um, so what we tended to find a lot in Fallujah was it seemed like buildings tended to have um, like one specific thing they were set up for. So you would have a house that had like a whole bunch of artillery shells or like IED making stuff. And then you'd have a house that had all sorts of like weapons. Then you'd have a house that had, um, you know, like a, like a big cache of drugs on the floor, excuse me. And, and things like that, you know, and obviously there'd be like other things, but it, it was like very much like things seem kind of oddly concentrated. So, and we would find like, you know, and houses having IEDs rigged into them or themselves being rigged to blow booby traps and things were always like a, a really prevalent danger, which just really added to what we were doing. So there was one particular day, uh, so we're moving, we we're on this street and, um, whatever fire team it was had made entry into this house and they had found like a, like they said there was like a bathtub that was filled with explosives and chunks of rebar. And basically the building itself was like set as like a, like a booby trap building, but whatever it was, they discovered this. So they pulled themselves out. So we called up the EOD guys. And so the EOD guys, and again, I, man, I have no freaking idea what the thought process was here, but the EOD guys decided the best way to deal with this house that was rigged to blow was to blow this house. Um, I was like, you know, kind of probably could have just done it by shooting at a bunch with the Mark 19 or 50 cal. But anyways, so Obviously, we get everybody pulled out of there. We get on the other side of this wall. And so I'm parked on the south side of the wall, and I have my driver, Gooch, with me. And the, the wall that we're parked beside is the wall to the compound of like that the, the house belongs to. And so I remember I was sitting down. So what I would do sometimes, I would set up like an ammo can where, my, where the little feet area was, and I would sit on that if I was trying to uh, sit down. So I'm sitting there. So my knees, if you can imagine, my, my knees are a little bit past the uh, the two front seats, you know, kind of in between myself and Gooch. The passenger door, which is my platoon sergeant's door, is open. And then Gooch is just sitting in the driver's seat and, uh, and all the other doors are closed. And so they, boom, they light this thing off. And uh, 
And it is a massive explosion. And it blows out the wall that we're sitting next to. And like multiple huge chunks of concrete blow straight in through that open door. And I could see it like, it was like it was slow motion, went right past my knees. And you know, thankfully, like if any one of those had hit my knees, I'd be a cripple. Um, possibly would have lost a leg, I don't know. Uh, but I remember like seeing it just go like, like waffle straight past me and um, and hit Gooch square in the arm. And it's it's weird when you see people like, you know, get injured that way because you can hear the impact of the thing hit them and then you can kind of hit, hear them make noise. So I hear this, I hear this like, just this like hollow like, Humph, and then I hear, Ugh! and, um, and so Gooch was sitting there. And so he gets hit square in the arm. So like his forearm and, um, and he didn't have the Humvee in park. He just had his foot on the brake. So it hits him and it actually like pushes him and the door open. Like that's how hard, um, these chunks of concrete hit and how close we were to this explosion. It blew out when it blew out the wall there. So he basically falls out the door. And he's getting dragged by the Humvee as it idles forward. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, the Humvee's going like two miles an hour because it's idling. But I'm sitting there. And so at first I kind of reached over and was trying to like pull him back in. Because I, you know, you just see somebody fall out and you're like, you're just like your snap reaction is like, oh my God, let me grab you. And so I'm kind of like grabbing him, but the Humvee's like rolling. So I was like, ah, shit. But I'm like basically kind of like sitting with my feet by it. So I managed to kick the, uh, uh, you know, I kicked the, the gear shift, um, you know, into park. And we kind of get Gooch out and... Uh, and then my fire team leader had gotten wounded as well. Like a chunk hit him like right in the shin. And it was nasty. Like not a, not a very big chunk hit him in the shin. Thankfully, he would have lost a leg. Um, but so he was limping around pretty good from that. And um, and so Gooch had to be evacuated because, I mean, his his arm, I mean, it was it was a compound open fracture. Like the bone was just, it was he was just mangled. But uh, it was kind of funny though because so Gooch had this uh, like stuffed like monkey. The one where it has like the Velcro feet and the Velcro like hands so you can like velcro it around stuff and he had it velcroed around the mirror and um and gooch was like an older guy i want to say he was like in his mid or late 20s you know so he, he was an older dude to still be a, a lance corporal with us and so he he got away with a degree of being able to give our platoon sergeant sass that nobody else did and so uh and so to gooch's credit man like he let out a couple like whelps you know but he uh like he got himself under control awfully quick for like getting his getting his stuff wrecked like that so we call over corman and we're like hey we got to evacuate him and then he goes he's like don't forget my fucking monkey staff sergeant <laughs> and so staff sergeant matt goes over and takes his monkey off the mirror and uh and uh like sets it on him so he could take him away but um uh, remember that happened one of those days so now um we'll kind of we'll move ahead to november the 19th so november the 19th was a uh it was uh, another one of those days. So I think I could find the actual street where this happened. Um, or I can get very, I can get awfully, awfully close to where this happened. So we were in this part of the city and I remember, um, and I, cause I can remember like the corner that I was sitting on straight ahead, you could see a solid wall. So I'm pretty sure this has to be the solid wall on this. And it was one block away. So if I had to um, if I had to guess, I, I want to say that, uh, like, I want to say where this took place was somewhere in this neighborhood here, um, cause of where we were, where we were sitting. So we're I'm trying to back up the roads like a smidge, like where it was in front of me. Um, cause it had this, had a solid wall right there and where we were based at with the reeds that were kind of close by. So we were somewhere on one of these near the, uh, um, like what would be this road. And so it was probably actually, it was probably very likely that, uh, that it was like this block or this block, something like that, where we were. Um, you know, if I, if I remember correctly, again, I, I reserve the right to be slightly wrong. Cause I'm basing all this purely on memory from, uh, 18 years ago. But, uh, so um, so what had been kind of going on that day was, I remember it was, it was another one of those days where like we were clearing houses and doing stuff, but it was, it was a little bit of a screw around day, you know? Cause I remember specifically, so guys in my, uh, uh, in my squad had just come out of a house and, um, and they'd found like a, like a dragon of in there and kind of some stuff. And so this guy West comes out and he's like, Oh, Hey, check this out. Hey, you know? And so we had everybody kind of set up. And again, not a hundred percent certain that it is, 
you know, actually this road. I don't remember the road being offset and that's kind of messing with me a little bit. So it's also possible that we were back a little bit further. And so this was like the wall that I was looking at and it might've been like, you know, more like, like this building, like up here. But anyway, so, um, so it was kind of, it was one of those, again, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of make up the location a little bit. So the, like we had a couple tanks with us and we had bulldozers and it kind of moved along and were ahead of us. And then my Humvee was set up facing directly South on the road. And, um, and so then guys from my squad. And so remember, so by the, by the time that this happened, so who was actually left in my squad? So Gooch and I were in a vehicle. Uh, that's two of us. And then as far as dismounted guys that were still in country, it was Hoffman, Thompson, Sergeant Welke West. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Pretty sure that's all the guys in my squad that were, uh, that were left in country at that point. So, um, so I'm sitting on the corner and I am one removed from, uh, from the building they go to make entry into. So again, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of make this up a little bit so that I can be able to properly tell the story. So we're going to imagine that I'm sitting on this corner right here. So you see how there's a house here and there's a house here. So, um, all of a sudden, all sorts of hell breaks loose in this house right here. And I'm sitting on this corner and the wall around it was, it was, it was relatively tall. I don't know. It's probably six foot, maybe eight foot wall, whatever, you know, kind of their standard brick wall. And it was just tall enough, like, cause I could see like, cause obviously I've got the building that's like, you know, right at, it, you know, it directly at my basically one o'clock and then there at, you know, like my two, two o'clock. I could not see the actual courtyard in the building. I could see the tops of the bottom floor windows over the wall. And there's all sorts of like shooting and stuff going on. Um, and so I'm going to kind of bounce back between like what I personally saw and then what I've been able to get as feedback from guys, um, you know, over the years and, and kind of figure it out. So I'll step out of things that I, I did not witness this myself, but basically after talking to guys there is what happened is West was the first one to make entry into this house. And he gets, he makes entry into this house. And there was a guy at the end of the hallway who had a machine gun and basically just lit him up instantly. Dropped him right there in the doorway, basically. Um, but he, he made it into the house slightly. Corporal Sergeant was on, he was outside, but he's basically on one side of the door. And he told me this personally. And so what he said is he basically, he kind of tried to juke the machine gunner. So he kind of like, he sort of like stepped out to get the guy to take a, take a, a burst at him. So as soon as the guy took the burst, then he tried to reach in and grab West. And the guy just hit him with another burst and he shot him. Um, like in the leg and the arm and stuff like that. So he fell out. Um, and at the same time, somebody in one of the first floor windows shot Welke and wounded him and dropped him in the yard. So Welke started trying to crawl towards the other two guys. And another guy, you know, whether it was the same guy or not, but somebody there then threw a grenade at him, like a pineapple grenade, wounded him with the grenade. And so that's what was going on. Um, like at first, I did not personally witness that where I became aware of what was going on was so obviously I hear all the shooting. So I look over there and I see, we had this engineer attached to us, a guy by the name of, uh, Brad arms, corporal arms. So there was a, there was a gate, like a car gate that went into the yard and then a, like a personnel, like a regular door gate, which is very common over there. So arms ran in from the gate towards the house and I could see him the entire way. Um, cause the way I could kind of see over like the courtyard or, or like, however it was with the angle he was, I could see him the entire time. So this is probably, I don't know, 30 yards away, not very far. Um, you know, so I see him, so he runs in and he got basically two strides in. So he was like, hit his left foot, hit his right foot. And then, you know, he decided, uh Oh, didn't want to be there. So he turns to run back out the gate and whoever was inside shooting shot him twice. And uh, this I saw clear as day. Both of them hit him in like the one rib and then came uh, like the one side of his chest and then came out the other side. And it, and it was and it was something kind of out of a movie because you could see the dust like fly off where it hit him, you know. And so it was like, it was like whack, whack, hits him there two times, comes out the other side, drops him in place. And so he's by the um, the personnel door. So my platoon sergeant is on one side of the door and Staff Sergeant Norred, I think, or possibly Gunny... Um, uh, Gunny Bass is on the other side. I know my platoon sergeant is on the one side for certain. And so arms falls basically right in front of them. And he kind of with his, sort of his last like 
effort before he dies. He he kind of reaches out and it's it's the kind of like reach that's like really like sort of gut wrenching to see because it's like the it's like that this dude ain't this dude ain't making it. It's just like his last vestige. So he reaches out. My platoon sergeant and you know either staff sergeant or gunner, whoever it was, they basically they both reach in there to try to grab him. Machine gunner inside hits him again with a whole burst and just massacres him with a whole bunch of rounds. And they all they hit the doorway and the door and all that. And so I remember seeing my platoon sergeant and um, whoever was with him there, like both kind of like you know duck oh shit like get back and it's like pap, 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 hits all over that doorway. And so so now shit is going down and. Um, and so they, uh, so they basically, they brought down, uh, like the hammer on themselves. So now at this point I can, I see the arms is down. And so people start kind of like shooting at one of the windows. And so at this point I crank, I turned the Mark 19 over to the, and I pointed at the building. I wasn't going to shoot it. Uh, but in my head I was like, okay, people are shooting over there. I might, they might ask me to, to drop the building down. So I'm, I'm going to be ready for it. And so then I see somebody, so like I said, is, you know, most Iraqi stairwells are in, like most Iraqi houses, you can take the stairs all the way up to the roof. And so there's one of these where like, where the stair went upstairs, there was a window on it. And so as I was looking over there, um, somebody came to the window and tried to open the curtain. So I shot him with my rifle, um, dropped him back inside. And then basically everybody who was anywhere near that starts just spraying the building down. So what my, um, what my assumption is, is that was basically when we were trying to get guys in there to grab the wounded dudes and, uh, and the bodies, bring them back out. So I kind of, uh, instead of shooting at that building, because again, like I said, if I'm, if I'm just kind of describing it. So again, so I'm, I, I don't think it was this building specifically, I, I'm, cause it wasn't this long of a distance, um, where it was. So I, you know, we, again, I wish I could remember the exact specific building, you know, it might've because there was a solid wall, it's possible that it, you know, it was, it was in this, it had to be in this area here because I know where we kind of went next. So it's entirely possible actually that it was like this compound right there because this runs into the wall that I could see in front of me and it kind of fits with everything else. So it's very possible that it was this as well. But so imagine, so there's that building right here and my Humvee is parked directly on this corner facing down here. And then this house, for example, is where everything's going down. So I started shooting at the house that was right in front of me, like because I could see in the windows, I could see in the door that was right in front of me. And the wall was tall enough that when I shouldered my rifle and tried to aim at the building right in front of me, I could not hit the I could not hit over the wall and inside of the first floor. So I actually um, I was actually holding my rifle over my head, like I had it resting on my helmet, and I was like shooting, and I was basically just walking the rounds. Um, cause obviously I could see the impacts on the, you know, the concrete floor of the house and whatever else I was just walking the rounds into the house right there. And, um, and, uh, you know, while, while things were going on and again, I don't know, I don't know at this point, I don't personally know what happened in the courtyard. I, I saw arms get shot and killed myself. So now at some point my weapon goes, uh, like I, I have to tend to my Mark 19. So I move it over. And at some point with that, um, as I'm, you know, it was either when I was moving the Mark 19 or when I was like reloading my rifle. I don't remember specifically what, but I happened to be looking towards my left arm. And so you guys have seen the Marine Corps digi cami. So we have a, we have a pocket basically on each, you know, bicep, like on the, or, you know, kind of outside the shoulder there. And it's got like a little, obviously a little flap with uh, two buttons. So I happen to be looking towards my arm and I take round goes straight through the flap on my pocket. And I was like, Whoa. Um, I don't know where it came from. And I was like, oh, okay. And like, at this point it's just, it is absolute pandemonium. Um, you know, because there was just a cacophony of noise going on with this building. We're trying to figure stuff out. So I get the Mark 19 aimed at the building. I was suppressing some of that stuff. And then, um, so I, I had went through multiple magazines with my rifle. So at some point I made another, so I made another reload, um, you know, with my rifle. And, um, and, uh, so I, I had my, Mark 19 aimed what would basically be my vehicles two o'clock, one or two o'clock there towards the building where the guys had all gotten shot, but I hadn't, I wasn't firing my Mark 19. I had my rifle resting on, um, like either the gun shield or kind of like my arm and aimed down the street. So again, let's, let's just, for example sake, let's say it's, it's this area right here. So I had my rifle aimed down the street and then all of a sudden I look in front of me. So this, the distance, and this is why I'm having a little bit of trouble figuring out exactly where it was because the distance was only like 50 yards, which makes me think that this is a good candidate for where it happened or at the least very close. 
It's only about three, uh, 50 yards away, sorry. And I see three dudes go running across the road. And they are the most obvious foreign, like the most obvious, like, you know, insurgents that you could possibly craft up. So the first guy running across has, uh, he has, he's holding an AK, you know, kind of like port arms, like running across the road. And he has two belts of ammo for the, the PKM. So for the, uh, for the medium machine gun draped across his neck. And so th those belts are long. So it's like dragging, like, you know, by his feet running across the road. The second guy has a PKM that he's kind of holding across his body in front. And then he has a belt of ammo across his neck running across. The third guy has an RPG and then he has a backpack on his back with extra RPG rounds. So I see this, it's clear as day. I put my front sight post right in front of the first guy, start pulling the trigger, nothing happens. I was like, what the hell? So I go tap, rack, nothing happens. And I was like, oh, shit. So I try to grab the Mark 19 and move it. And so luckily these guys, I mean, these guys are really weighed down. So they're moving kind of slow, but obviously the turret's broken. So I managed to move the Mark 19 right as the third guy was passing the corner. And I go, bat, 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 put a few rounds down there. And so I kind of sprayed the last guy uh, with shrapnel from that. So I'm trying to kind of process all this stuff as it's going on. So at, at this point, they had brought west. So we got the guys out of the courtyard and out of the building where they were in. So they had brought west and they set him next to my Humvee. So again, let's just imagine this is where it was. So they set him on this side. So the east side of my Humvee. But was basically it was serving as the back of it because obviously everything's going on in this area if we use that as an example. So they set him over there. And they had him stripped down to just his like green silky shorts, and he was. I mean, West was a ginger anyways, but this is the whitest I've ever seen a human being before. He was he was not dead yet, but he was basically um, he was basically bled out. And the company commander was there like holding, like, kind of holding his hand and was like he was like West, you know, like I don't know, I'm trying to say stuff to him like you know come back, come back. And I was like, I was like, dude, that homie's dead. Um, but um, so then, so this is going on right then. So I, so I take magazine out, put a new magazine in. And so I don't, I don't think I like figured it out exactly that moment. What I'd figured out is that at some point, uh, when I put that magazine in my rifle, I took a round through the magazine and, um, and it broke the spring. So what had happened was when I tried to shoot at the three guys running across the road, there was no round that had gone into the chamber the last time that I'd fired in the bolt cycle because the spring was broken, so nothing to push it up. So when I tap rack, there's nothing for it to hit. Um, so I have a new magazine in there. And so now at this point, um, again, I still don't know exactly what's going on with there. At, at some point, they bring uh, they bring Welke past us as well. And Wel Welke is still, like, fine at this point. Like, he's they got, like, a tourniquet on his arm. Cause I, I can't remember what was what. I think he got shot in the leg and, like, a grenade in the arm or vice versa. I don't remember specifically. But he was like complaining about like the tourniquet being too tight. Like he was still full, of, he was still full of piss and vinegar. Um, Welke actually ended up dying of a blood clot the next day um, on his way to uh, Landstuhl, Germany. Um, so, and then at some point they also brought Alex, you know, like Corporal Sergeant around as well. And so he'd been wounded in the leg and the arm and stuff. And so, at some point my my friend Thompson, so not my fire team leader, uh, so we called him Big Thompson, and Little Thompson, because Big Thompson was like six three, two forty, and then uh, Little Thompson was like six foot, like, you know, 210. He's like my size, a little bit taller. But, uh, so he was next to my Humvee and then I started hearing people running across the rubble. Um, so like, again, so if we use this building as an example, and again, I'm not, I don't know that it was this building, but so if we use this as an example, there was like buildings here and one of the buildings over there was kind of wrecked. And then I started hearing like people running across the rubble. So I stood up in the turret and I started chucking grenades over there. Because basically, so in my mind, so if you're here, so if it's, you know, I, I don't know for certain. But um, so the three guys ran across here. So if they had come into this courtyard and were trying to move up here, they could very easily flank what was a huge grouping of us. Because we had, you know, tanks, we had like bulldozers, all sorts of people, wounded guys, all sorts of stuff on this. So as soon as I started hearing, um, you know, like footsteps and people running across the rubble up there, I started throwing grenades um, over the wall. And it was... It was a very odd distance because, so I was kind of standing like on the turret, uh, like standing out of the top of it. Um, I'm trying to think of how I stood exactly. Like I would kind of stand, so I'd have like one leg kind of out and one leg kind of like on the, like the seat or something. So I wasn't like standing physically on the roof of the Humvee, but I was basically standing on like as high as I could get with like still technically having my feet inside of there. 
And I was, you know, and obviously you're wearing like your vest and stuff. So my grenade throwing distance is not, uh, not very good at this point. And there was a wall that was exactly like 30 yards away or something like that. And that was like, I could hear the, the running coming from right on the other side of that, but it was like at the, that was at like 98% of my grenade range. So I, I, I threw a bunch of grenades over there, but not all of them made it on the other side. So I kept like, I'd get one over, I'd miss one. I get two over and I'd miss one, you know? And so I keep trying to, to throw grenades over there and uh, going off. And then, then we didn't hear any more running over there. So I don't know. I don't know if I eliminated them with grenades. I don't know if they ran off and went the other way. Just I have no idea. Never went over there to verify because of the situation that we were in. So, um, so my platoon sergeant comes over at some point and he's like, what do you got? And I was like, hey, three dudes busted across the road right here. We could hear them flanking over there. And then there's there was kind of like a, basically like a little outbuilding that would be kind of in the, uh, like the garden slash, you know, kind of a little livestock area in um, in the, the compound that was next to us. And I was like, and I saw this door over here move. I want to put it down with the Mark 19. He goes, okay, yeah, bring it down with the Mark 19. So I cranked the Mark 19 over there, basically shoot as much as it takes to just completely collapse that. Again, don't know if anyone was in there. Um, you know, at the time. So now, um, now we're basically kind of getting things under control. So we got the guys out of here. And so we bring the bulldozers up and the bulldozers are wrecking um, this. And by wrecking, I mean wrecking. So now, again, I'm, I'm going to make up like locations for people. So now while this was going on, again, I had to be told this later, um, the, the remainder of my fire team, which was just <laughs> Big Thompson and Hoffman, were on the building like adjacent to the house where everyone got shot in and they could look over the wall into the backyard. So while they were up there, um, like a whole bunch of guys tried to run out the back. So, so like, you know, what they told me was like, like a half a dozen guys, like five or six guys tried to run out the back and Hoffman just happened to be sitting there with his saw. And when they came out the back, you know, he's only like 10 yards away up on the roof adjacent to him. He cut in with one long burst, dropped them all, uh, in the backyard uh, which is like the coolest thing that you could possibly do, um, you know, as a machine gunner. Because obviously I had my own machine gunner's dream with those three guys running across and had a weapons malfunction because of, you know, a magazine getting shot. So Hoffman drops all those guys. And then apparently um, there was another guy that came out that was kind of with the group, but he was a few, he was a little bit back from them. So he sees everyone in front of him get dropped. Looks like something, you know, on freaking Omaha Beach running out of the freaking Higgins boats. So he runs... Basically, he kind of what would be to his right, but to the wall that was basically right in front of where the two guys in my fire team were. He starts basically trying to shoot up at him over this wall. So they're trying to shoot at him, but basically the way they were sitting on the roof and the way the wall was, they he couldn't they couldn't get the angle. So <laughs> I was trying to tell people it's like like combat is really funny in a lot of ways. So at some point, Hoffman was holding on to Thompson's belt, and Thompson was leaning off of the roof with his rifle in one hand, trying to shoot the guy. And uh, I don't know if he ever did from there or not, but they ended up throwing a grenade over there and getting the guy with the grenade. And then at some other point, another guy came running out the back. He got all the way to like the, the doorway at the backyard that like went out to the road, but he like stopped to like look for some direction to go. Thompson shot him in the chest and the guy basically like, like he kind of like winced, like you see like a deer wince when it gets hit with an arrow and the guy threw his rifle on the ground and took off running, probably dropped, you know, a block later or something like that. And so we finish off the building with the bulldozer and I've heard like multiple numbers, but we think we probably killed, you know, north of 15 uh, enemies in that building. So basically it was essentially just a death trap house and there's nothing that anybody could do about it. You know, it was one of those where like, if you had seen some sort of sign from the outside and you could have been like, Hey, I don't think we should go in this. That would have been the best thing. But it was like, whatever it was, they, they were all in there, you know, they happened to not be seen. And, um, and they're just waiting and there's, that's just, uh, I don't, I don't think I believe in fate or religion or any of that sort of stuff, but it's, there's not a lot that you're doing in that situation. Sometimes you just, uh, sometimes your choice is between eating dog shit or eating horse shit. And so, uh, that's pretty much what happened there. So, um, so as this kind of like ends and why I know roughly where we were is because the tanks moved off ahead of us and we kind of moved around without clearing stuff. And we ended up, I'm pretty, I'm almost hundred percent certain. I am hundred percent certain it's gotta be this road. Cause we, we moved around like skirting the reeds and the tanks were like out here. So like each tank was like out here and they were just cycling through their coax. So they're 240, like out into this. They said they each went through like a thousand rounds of coax. Cause apparently we had chased a whole bunch of other guys, something like 15 or 20 guys into one of the buildings down here 
we got them hemmed up, unloaded into it with like vehicles and everything else that we could and, um, and stuff and, and killed all them in there. And then additional guys all went running off into the reeds. And so, so the reeds here, um, it was really swampy. So like, you cannot pass this on foot if you are like dressed, like we're dressed when we, you know, go into combat because we tried it later. Somebody's bright idea to do it. And, um, it almost got, uh, almost got me and a couple other guys. Well, not, I don't, I don't know about almost got us killed, but we got very freaking stuck and had to have people like literally like we could not get ourselves out of there because we tried to cut off, uh, like we basically tried to walk straight across this because where we got set up later at the end of the battle was this is the Raider Ranch right here. This is the, where the company's main building was. And then we were also like in this house right there. So what we had been doing is we always had to walk around, get over to here to get onto this road to then cut through the reeds or go south and cut on this road there. And this just took a long time. It was kind of a little precarious because it was a dirt road and we're like, hey, we don't want to hit IEDs. So someone was like, but nobody had tested, hey, can you just walk across the reeds? And I guess, okay. So they decided one day we were going to be the ones to test it. And it was like, nope, you cannot walk across the reeds there. But uh, so anyway, so the tanks, you know, were just like lighting off into this. I mean, and it was like getting to be dusk because I, I remember it was like, I, I was like kind of sitting behind him and my, like, in, like my Humvee was behind him and they were just cycling through coax, um, you know, and they basically kind of, you know, talking about platoon sergeant came with the radio. They're like, they're like, Hey, we need to stop. We've each put over a thousand rounds to our barrels. We got to let our barrels, you know, cool off and we need to go back and, you know, uh, refit and rearm, you know, for the day. So then we came up and we stayed in, we stayed somewhere over in here. I don't remember specifically where, cause I remember we kind of pulled in front of one of the buildings and then, um, and my platoon sergeant kind of like turned me loose. He's like, Hey, you know, whatever buildings you can kind of see like around this, I want you to, I want you to, you know, like, like work them over pretty good. So basically, cause we'd had a, a rough day, like numbers wise. So we wanted to like try to set up a good perimeter, you know? So at this point, um, so basically what we took that day was so, uh, so Philip West died that day. Joe Welke died the next day. Um, corporal, so Brad arms died that day. And he was an attachment to us. I don't. I think he was a reservist engineer. So I don't know what reserve what engineer unit that would be. Um, and so then, obviously, so Alex Sargent was severely wounded and sent back. So by this point, my squad, the only members of my squad that are still in country, is um, is uh, I believe I believe Gooch was still with us at the time. So me and Gooch, and then uh, Thompson and Hoffman. So it's just the uh, just the four of us were the only ones left. Um, from my squad of 13 that started the deployment. And so, uh, so obviously, so things got, you know, pretty, pretty rough with that. And then, you know, kind of like, I don't, um, I don't remember specifically, you know, what we, like if anything happened during the night on there, but then, and this is be what I closed with is so then what we did was, so, um, so it was like the next day or the day after, um, they, we pull, I think it was, I think it was literally the next day. Maybe we did one more day of clearing, but anyways, so it was either the, the next day or the day after they actually pulled us, um, back. We went up route Henry and everything. And we went back up to the train station up here. And we actually, we stayed there for one full day. And, um, we basically did like, you know, refit, rearm. We had all sorts of like enemy weapons and all sorts of crap in the Humvee. So we literally just made like a huge pile of like captured weapons and captured equipment stuff. You know, we, uh, we like tried to eat food and stuff. And, um, and so we stayed there just for like one day and, um, kind of refit. They also had a satellite phone that they were passing around. And so they're letting guys make calls with that. And so I waited, you know, I tried to be like the last person to use it because I'd gotten to make a call when I got wounded. And, and obviously like, so I was out for like, you know, two days because of that. So I, you know, I, I did not want to be one of the first ones to use the phone. So I was trying to let everybody else use the phone. And then, and it was kind of really awkward, um, because like the parents had a, like a parent's, you know, email or chat room or, you know, I, I don't know what the hell you'd call it. Um, you know, kind of a uh, kind of group for the parents of my platoon, uh, of the guys in my platoon. And it just so happened that, um, uh, like Phil West's, parents or at least one of his parents were like really active in that and um and stuff like that and so they had made an announcement in there that you know philip had been killed the day before and so uh so when i got a chance to call 
it was it was kind of awkward because um, you know so I you know my I know my dad was on the phone. I don't know if mom was there as well or not. I can't remember. But uh, so I called and uh, I was like, you know, hey, it's Lane. And um, and my dad was like, hey, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm back with the unit, you know, doing doing stuff. And he goes, hey, did uh, did you guys lose a guy yesterday? And I was like, yeah, we lost we lost more than just one guy yesterday. And I could hear him like kind of like sniffling up on the other side of the phone. So that was kind of. That was kind of rough, you know, because my my dad's, you know, he's he's your standard uh, like baby boomer. But like also like all the males on my dad's side of the family, myself included, are all very not talkative, introverted, not emotional kinds of people. But for him to kind of get, uh, you know, busted up about that was kind of that was probably, you know, as you know, as, as difficult as anything else with that. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, we uh, made a couple guys get hurt. I was like, hey, we're. We're basically, you know, we're we're essentially we're taking a day to refit, and then we're you know we're kind of going back and getting into uh, operations and stuff like that. And it was it was kind of the the first time that I had ever heard, not heard, I don't I, or sensed any sort of like, uh, what's the right word? Like any sort of like anxious, like you know, kinds of stuff from my old man. And I guess I think it messed with him. Um, because I was, so I'd gotten wounded and obviously the Marine Corps made that really, really like tactless phone call. Um, luckily I had gotten a call right before that. And then, you know, so at this point of the guys, not even in my platoon, but it, so in my squad, so we went over there with 13 guys. And so we had, uh, Perez, Welke, West had all been killed. D-man wounded multiple times, evacuated where... Uh, wounded multiple times, evacuated. Corporal Kruger, wounded multiple times, evacuated. Solberg, evacuated. Um, so who else? Gooch, evacuated. I'm left. Thompson's left. Hoffman's left. Who else did we? Uh, Parrot, shot, <laughs> wounded, evacuated. Um, and then Alex Sargent, wounded, um, evacuated. Did I say him twice? Anyways, so we're basically, so we're down to just me, Thompson, Hoffman, uh, are left in the squad that are still there. So, you know, of, of the platoon group and the squad group, you know, basically, you know, I, I assume as far as my parents felt that it was like, hey, uh, <laughs> kind of running a little low on numbers here. And I guess, I guess my dad had, had uh, you know, like a few, a few days where like he drove by the house, um, like when he was, you know, like doing stuff for work or whatever. And was like, was like looking for the, uh, you know, the, uh, like the KIA, whatever you call them, like the casualty notification guys or whatever, because because it, it got you know it, it was rough. So like my platoon uh, like took it pretty rough there. So I'll try to do a like a better breakdown at the end. But I, I tried to count it up the other day, and I think so. We went into Iraq, my first deployment with forty three. I think we had a full complement, uh, so forty three total between you know two hospital corpsmen and um, and then everyone else. By the time we finished the deployment and actually came back home, I believe we had 16 guys still in country. So between KIA and wounded in action. So we got, we got hit pretty hard. So, you know, in some ways it's, you know, I would rather be in my position being in combat than I would, you know, than I would want to be at home, like having to wait for news like that. So there's part of me that kind of understand that, you know, understands it when it comes to that. But, uh, so that was kind of an interesting one. Cause that's not, you know, from someone I'd expect it from, but, uh, so I think that's a good place to stop for the day. So we're at the train station taking a uh, single day's rest and refit and all that sort of stuff. And then the next day we uh, we head back into the city to basically just continue to re-clear stuff. And we'll pick it up uh, with that um, in my next episode. But remember, guys, only the hits count and you can never miss fast enough to catch back up.